Hey, welcome to Copy Compiler Club. We're here today to talk about compilers or maybe uh, parser combinators, whatever the heck those are, um, and language runtimes and anything and everything to do with implementations of languages and typing systems and lifetime management and no, not the null. Everyone's being recorded within YouTube within a couple hours. Um, and today we, and that was the end of my starting spiel. Today we have a special guest, Jamie Willis, who's going to talk to us about partial combinators, which I think are your, some relation to your PhD thesis. And you're mm -hmm. aiming to get a, a position at Imperial College. So this is like London or something, UK somewhere. Yes. Yeah. Right on all fronts, vaguely. This is my American geography at work here. I can find England on a map, maybe. All right, sir, <laughs> take it away. All right. Thanks. Um, yeah, what what are post combinators? That's that's what I want to know. Uh, yeah. Um, if you enable screen sharing as well, I can share my uh, oh. PS Code window. Yes, um, I can. Try now. Amazing. Yeah, that should have worked. It's, it's kicking in. You Seems to be. View, viewable fonts like you've done this before. I know, right? I know. Um, I'm definitely a pro. Uh, this file, by the way, is as much preparation as I've done for this talk. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, we'll get directed by whatever we happen to talk about. Uh, it doesn't phase me in the slightest. So yeah, I've, um, I'm, I'm technically speaking in my fifth year of PhD right now. So I've been dealing with this in some form or another for six years uh, because I also did my master's in the same sort of area. And um, and so, yeah, parser combinators. So I guess a good characterization is if you want to write a parser, you're probably writing it in one of two ways. The first might be that uh, you use a parser generator like, you know, Antler or Bison or something. And uh, if you're not a fan of parser generators, as quite a lot of people aren't, I'm certainly not a fan of parser generators, then you might opt instead for uh, handwritten recursive descent. Ah, handwritten. Which is, yes, English versus American. It is the it is the wonderful uh, chaotic um, wilderness of parser writing where anything goes, but importantly, um, you can get anything done. So something that I I kind of don't like too much about parser generators is that error messages are really difficult to get really good. Um, often you have to fight the tool in order to do it, and it's, it's a bit less straightforward. With handwritten recursive descent, you just sort of do it. Right? You, you put in the errors, you do what you want. And this advantage, of course, is that it's you know it's it's not similar to to a high level grammar. It's 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 detached somewhat, um, but it is faster. Um, there's a lot of advantages to be said for it. So what are plus combinators? Well, they sit somewhere in the middle and effectively parser combinators they don't uh, they sort of they don't live on their own so if you get a parser generator you, you have a language for it and you write a grammar in that language and then it will get compiled into a parser usually uh, with parsing tables sometimes recursive descent whatever in the language that you then want to work in. Pass combinators, you write them in the language that you're working in. So you better hope that that language has parser combinators, though um, the definition of pass combinator is so lax that, I mean, you could get a pass combinator library in C or Java or whatever. They just have different fields to them. So effectively, parser combinators are a sort of way of writing handwritten recursive descent in a more uh, abstracted and principled way. So the sort of main idea, I guess, is that uh, with parser combinators, parsers are first class values. So you know if you think if you think to your normal paradigms, you've got OOP and that's kind of like 
objects are this first class construct in the language. You can manipulate objects as values. Functional programming uh, can be characterized as functions themselves are first class values, so you can pass them around. By that definition, C is a, is a functional programming language, but works fine for my purposes. Um, so pass combinators are all about the idea that passes themselves are just values. You can manipulate them, pass them around, do whatever you like with them. And the combinators are functions that stitch passes together, very simply. So the most libraries will provide a certain set of combinators and a certain set of small primitive passes. And the idea is you take these small chunks and you build them out and out and out until you've got something big. So ultimately, we can sort of play around with these a little bit and try and work from the from the very inside outwards and see what they do. Um, and so I'll give a small example of what a parser might look like. Uh, and let's just go with item. Now, item returns or basically passes any single character from the input. And there's a few interesting things to note about this. The first is that it's got type Parsley. Now, um, Parsley is the, the name of the parsing library I'm using. It was my master's thesis. Uh, it has grown swiftly out of control since then. Um, and Parsley represents the type of parsers itself. And in square brackets here, which I'm using Scala, by the way, uh, in Scala, generics are sort of denoted by square brackets. So this is saying that this is a parser that returns a char. Right? This isn't a parser that's sort of eating chars. It's a parser that is returning chars. Um, so we can play around with this a little bit and we can say something like p.pass and we'll give it a. And we'll just run that, see what happens. And we get success. A. Now, I could feed whatever I like to this. Uh, I'm always going to get successes. So here we go. That's success D. Uh, there's no sort of necessity for me to pass all the input here. I haven't told it to do that. So it's going to read a character and then it's going to stop and be perfectly happy. But instructively, if I were to give it the empty string, I get, ooh, I get a failure. Line one, column one, unexpected end of input, expected any character. So, so far, so good. I've got myself a parser. I've done some things with it, but I've pretty much exhausted all of the things that I could do with that one parser. Um, so something else I might want to do is uh, I want to find ways of combining them. So first combinator I'm going to show is uh, right arrow or then or uh, discard then. There's there's plenty of different pronunciations for it. And effectively, what it's doing is it's taking two parsers or it's a sort of method on parsers um, in a way that it is ignoring the result of the first one, but it's doing them in sequence. So this is saying read an item, then read another item, and I care about this one. Right. The arrow is pointing at it. It's it's sort of written in that sort of direction. Um, and it's nice that Scala gives me this option, but you know, it doesn't mean that you have to have operators to do it. You can imagine that this could be written as something like this in a different language uh, that doesn't have a then keyword. Um, so you know, the, the choice of operator here is arbitrary, but uh, there is sort of two or three operators that I will use liberally here. Um, we'll see the other one in a minute. Uh, and they're just sort of very small. They're easy enough to understand uh, on their own. So if we try passing this, we'll give it a B. And the result that we'll get back is the B, right? Because we read an A with item. And then we're going to read something else afterwards, a B. And that's the thing we cared about. So if I cared about the A instead, I could flip the arrow around um, and I get an A back. So, so far, so good. Right? This is very, very simple stuff. So I guess item is, is one of these things where it's we, not very useful on its own. So we, we might go we, something we, like... Run the, run the short one, drop the B in your string. 
Oh, good, yeah, good idea, good idea. So we've got unexpected end of input, expected any character. So it did consume the A. You can see we got to column two. It was perfectly happy with that, but it is stuck at needing a B. Now, the, there should be a carrot here. The carrot's decided it wants to disappear. Um, I'm not sure why. Oh, it I found a bug. Good. But um, yeah, is, it's. Uh, should be it, is this a look ahead? Is no. it a look ahead? No. A red it's item. A it looks like a red item because it's looking ahead but returning the thing behind. It's well, well, no. So that so the item the item has been physically consumed, ah. um, and it it won't backtrack from that point. So that this thing has happened. It's just that when both of these passes have succeeded, we get to pick which result we care about effectively. Um, so you can think of this is recursive descent. You might have something like, you know, if uh, input exists, then uh, if input exists after consuming, I guess we'll have some T's, T's dot exists, T's eat exists, then, well, yeah, so, but I mean, I could imagine this being uh, useful, like, for instance, if you've got commas separating the items in a list, you want to get rid of the comma. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I, I usually call those peak. And if it's, if I say, if peak a comma, then if it is a comma, I'm successful and I eat it. And if it's not a comma, yes. I return a false. So it's a Boolean test if peak. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so it's it's very much the same kind of thing here. Um, and in this case, we've just chosen to return C. If I flip this around, we could think of this as instead returning now T's.eat, right? So the C is now forgotten about, um, but they're still happening. They're still happening in the same order. It's just what thing is ultimately returned you in a kind of yeah. abstract way. Um, so yeah, we can, we can play around with, uh, some other things to see how a few things sort of work out. Uh, so I could just use digit. Now, digit is another parser um, that has been set up to deal with matching various digits as well as different categories of digits. Um, but it's more instructive to see how digit might actually be formulated. So one of the most basic combinators that exists is satisfy, usually. And what satisfy says is if you give me a function that is a predicate on characters, I will pass it if that predicate returns true on the next character. So in this case, is digit will serve perfectly fine for a digit parser. And um, at the moment, it's not it doesn't really know what to do with that in terms of error messages. So I'm going to pull in. I'm going to pull in some extra goodies. So I can call it a name. So I can say this is a digit. So if I run this parser again, this time it's going to fail and it's going to say unexpected A, expected digit. Right. So clearly A is not a digit if I were to ask that. Yeah, that's that's clear to get a okay, false. So, so this satisfy isn't a predicate, it's a require a digit next. Yes. So it's saying read any single character that satisfies this predicate. Yeah, okay. And you can see that uh from the oh the carrot's back. Um from the column number, this hasn't actually consumed any input. So it is not the case that uh this consumes input. It is very much a peak until that predicate is satisfied, then it will consume. Um, so we can start now doing some interesting things with this, um, but it is interesting that we can label them with digits. So if I took this out, it would give a an error that makes no sense. It doesn't know anything. Um, but labeling allows us to start giving names to things and building up errors that way. So it is very much that you get that very fine grained control, but you also get uh, very little in the way of, you know, automatic niceties. 
Um, so I like to describe. Yep. Yeah. Well, how do you do? I want to say error recovery. Um, well, define error recovery. Yeah, exactly. Um, I would have expected a predicate, and then if I didn't find a digit, I would try something else. But if I found nothing that works, because I, I, I'm looking for a balanced close paren to hit the end of my input, then there's something that says I wanted to track the opening paren and I want to error you from beginning to end. I don't know. There, there are things I do for error recovery. And here yes. I to define a function body, and instead I found a definition. So I'm going to complain. Or one of several things. I want one of several things. You gave me none of the above. Yes. So let's let's uh, let's introduce another combinator for that um, called OR. And OR again is a method on on combinators. And it's going to take another parser, and the parsers have to match. That the types have to match. Um, but the idea is, if this one fails, we'll go on to the next one. Um, so I don't know. Let's also introduce dots. So we're allowed to read digits followed by another character, letters, or dots. So this should work out fine, right? Because it's not a digit, but then we'll try a letter, and that's OK. A dot will also be OK. And uh, now I need something that's not a letter, Bang. digit, or a dot. At sign. Semicolon. Semicolon. Yeah. yeah. Now we get expected dot right. digit or letter. That's nice. Um, so yes, the the idea is that effectively, and 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 it kind of depends. Different pass combinator libraries will do different things with the error messages. Um, but the way that that Parsley works with this is, error messages are always taken from the furthest position that the error got to. So if we change this to be something like uh, digit well. So if I give it uh, one, right, what do we expect here? We don't expect to, to hear about letters or dots. Right? We expect expect a digit, right? We didn't get one. Um, and indeed, if I give it one A, that's definitely still not a digit. So expect a digit got nothing at all here we're a bit stuck so this error message is sort of generated here and what we don't want is to try and backtrack and and report other errors because we've, we're sort of trying to take the most specific error that exists well your your choice your parse choice was first success is a success and you move on that's the sort of yes. the nature of recursive descent you, you you look ahead a little bit and then you made a choice and you're done with that choice yeah parser combinator is almost identical in a lot of ways to recursive descent it's just that it tends to it appears to integrate the uh, lexer as part of the parser itself yes at least, yes, exactly. at least that's the way jamie explained it to me i mean so when when he explained it to me because i'm used to working with recursive descent he explained it in terms of recursive descent it was super easy to understand. <laughs> What's a lexer? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no lexers here. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't, yeah, I don't do lexers either. No, it's fine. So, so uh, can, can you um, do something like put, I don't know, the satisfy tilde thing digit um, in parentheses and then label the whole works and say like double digit. Make a sub make a function call subroutine out of the find two digits. Yes, so I definitely can, um, and we find that that hasn't appeared when we run this. Right. Um, another sort of consequence of this find errors at the deepest out uh, deepest uh, position is that we have progressed first past the first digit, so double digit is no longer expected. Um, but if I were to change this to semicolon, then for sure we'd expect a dot, a double digit, or a letter. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. because it has not progressed into this thing, this is the label that will get picked, um, which is a really useful concept, because you can imagine um, if you have uh, numbers, say, you might want to say uh, label a number as number. But if you read at least one digit, you want to say that actually 
you expect end of number. So you want to be able to distinguish between not having started reading it and failed in the middle of reading it, which is why labels only apply at this sort of if input has not been consumed since label sort of acknowledged itself as being uh, used for something. Um, and another thing that you can do that's quite cool is uh, because we're a past commentator library, we can implement all sorts of arbitrary nonsense. Um, if you wanted to, you could explain yourself. So you could say, okay, well, we've got this double digit. What on earth does that actually mean? And you can get it to say, you know, double digit is two digits. Um, so you can sort of take this idea quite far. And this is why I sort of say it's it's that halfway house because the error messages that you build with this idea can be very, very specific and very tailored to the things that you're doing. And um, you're implementing it at a quite a low level way, but where you still have these sort of high level combinators. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm building up the, I'm parsing. Along the way, I'm building an AST. Where, where do you hook the AST in the year? Yeah, that's a good question. Or is so, it too soon, like I'm pushing you out of order? No, 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 no. It's a it's a logical next step. So yeah, it's a it's a different question. At the moment, we've been working with um, Parsley Chart, right? So all we can get is a character back. Uh, and unfortunately, we can only get one character back. Uh, um, so you know, how do you make how do you make progress from there? And you, uh, so I guess I, yeah, uh, you find a partially AST and you get an AST back. Yeah, exactly. So one one thing we could do to sort of demonstrate is we have digits, digits return characters, but we can have a map combinator that says, okay, well, I know you return a character. So if you give me a function that can turn that into anything else, I can return that instead. Um, so as digit is a function that converts a character to a digit, obviously, if it's valid. Um, so this has type past the int. And if we read a one, we'll get a one back. If we read zero, we get a zero back and so on. And but if you read not... a 99, it's two digits. And what do you do? And you only well, allow to pass this... one. Right, yeah. So you're only allowed to pass one. So at the moment, we have ways of reading digits. We have no way of combining digits. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's a few different ways you could do that. Um, the sort of the poor man's way of doing this would be to make use of a combinator called many. And what many says is, it's basically the star like of, of grammars, like the zero or more. It says, give me a parser, and that parser returns A, and I'll give you back a parser that returns a list of A, right? Every single one that I managed to get. So in this case, I guess should be sum. Sum is one or more, many is zero or more. Um, so we could say something like, I don't know, we have a list of characters here, turn it into a string, and turn it into an int. Awful way of doing this. If my students write this, I will dock them a mark for doing that because this is effectively reparsing. So it's a bit of a cheat. But we can now play around with it. So I guess we can get rid of we'll get rid of this. And we can pop num in there. Now these are going to start complaining. Um actually no it won't. It should unify to any, yes. So it still works. Um, and the reason is that uh, Scala here will just will realize that characters and integers are only represented by the any type um, together. So it, it will still work out. But ideally, you don't want to do stuff like that. Uh, so if I give it one, two, three, four, A, we're going to get one, two, three, four being the number. So just to prove that it is indeed the number, Hopefully, I've written a number that's big enough that, there you go, um, it's decided to crash with number format exception. So it really did try and build a number there. So this isn't ideal because we did crash in the process. Um, so perhaps a better way of doing this is to reach for some other magic. Um, so we could say uh, fold left, which is basically a reduction where you're saying read read something one or more times, but at every step, combine the results instead of making a list. Uh, so we could say something like n d and n times 10 plus d as digit. So this 
is also an integer. Um, and this is doing the whole thing where take the number that you currently read, times it by 10, add a digit, times it by 10, add a digit. This time we'll get a much more you know, sensible answer of an overflowed expression that's wrapped around at some point. But regardless, at least it didn't crash. So yeah, that's that's how we can start, you know, piecing some things together. But that's not really an AST, right? You asked for an AST and I gave you numbers which involved lists in the interim. And not everything is lists that can be turned into stuff so readily. Um, now, best way of discussing this without shooting myself in the foot is, I think, what I want is to pull in the zipped things. Um, there's a sort of minefield here that uh, the way that Scala's type inference works, if I use the way I, the thing I want to use, I'm going to have to write the types all the time. So I'm going to sort of sidestep that magically. Um, but let's imagine. Uh, I have a question want... in chat. Manus, why don't you just say it? Yeah, feel free to interrupt. Yeah, am I audible? Yes, you are on. Yes. On line 21 and 22, there is this bar. So basically, in like previously, we were using a satisfy and then we were parsing a digit. Yeah. So these bar were associated with, uh, are they associated with the satisfy condition or the parser after the arrow, till the arrow? They, they are the parser themselves. Right. So it's associated, it's an operator on parsers and um, hover, it, hover the operator for a little bit longer. You, you flash to it too quick and it doesn't have time to display. There you go. It's a good, a long, it's got a long documentation. Um, yeah, but it's yes. pronounced or. Yes, or, uh, or alt or any number of things that vaguely imply choice. Um, so there are some examples of them down there. Does the uh, order of those find? ors matter? Yes. The order of if these I say parse are... this thing as hex or parse it as decimal, all decimal yes. will be valid hex. Uh, yes, indeed. So yes, there is um there is a thing with uh, not all parse combinator libraries. So it kind of depends. Parse combinators uh, are Experimented in many, many different ways. I mean, one one valid interpretation. Just, just use yours. I mean, you're you're saying in order, or I understood it to be in order. I think that's a great answer. And yes, yes. So yeah, so yeah. So in in this case, um, the semantics of or are quite particular, and the reason is for error messages. Um, so this is one option that you could use to implement the passing type, right? You say it's a a function from strings to a list of, um, of sort of values of type A and more strings that come out, sort of residual strings. This isn't ordered, right? So this, you could you could put them in any order, it will always work. It will change what the order of the things is in the list, but you'll get the same results out. Um, the idea behind Parsley is that it matches something called peg, uh, which is parser expression grammars. And uh, in contrast to BNF, pegs basically have biased, um, biased or. So the idea is that this sort of, this whole bit here, um, we assume it's right associative, it's actually left associative, uh, but we hope that they're right associative. Um, parser actually does right associate them itself. So this parser is the sort of second alternative for num or. And it will only execute if num failed. Um, so if num succeeds, that's it. We stop. And uh, that gives us sort of this, this left biasing. Um, and it means that the order that you should do things in is always longest first. Now, often it doesn't matter because we aim to not have ambiguous grammars. Um, but if you did read something like ABC or AB, you would want ABC to come first because it's longer, right? If you just did AB first and you gave it ABC, well, we'll see what we can see what happens. Let's go and explore that. So let's say string AB or string ABC. 
So if I give this ABC, you know, if we're if we're working in a in a in a library where this doesn't matter, we'd expect ABC to come back, but instead we get AB because of this peg semantics. So it says AB succeeded. No reason to continue doing anything else, even if even if right that we said something like this where we need a b c d and afterwards we want to read d right this is going to fail and it's going to fail because it's going to say unexpected c expected d and the solution to this probably is something like that however this this would work in peg however there is one additional constraint on or which is that the right-hand side is only allowed to work if the left-hand side failed having not consumed input. So what we'll get here is, oh, yeah, okay, well that, that will succeed. Um, but if I took out the C, this is going to fail. Unexpected ABD, expected ABC. So you can see it's not even acknowledging this, this sort of second branch here. Um, and a nice way of sort of wait, visualizing wait, 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 wait. Wait, I'm, I'm missing. You yeah, hunted for AB. You hunted for ABC and failed, didn't consume. You hunted for AB, I would have thought you would have succeeded. Now you would hunt for D. It did right? consume. It well, did consume, yeah. That's the so, problem. If it hadn't that, consumed, it would have worked. Why does that is indeed consume when AB? So it's a good question. And the uh, best way of seeing this is to use a combinator that helps to see these things. Um, the debug combinator will help with that. So ultimately, you can see uh, what is the sort of status as we go in. So we're going into the OR. Nothing has happened yet. The, the input has not been consumed. We enter the ABC. And as we exit the ABC, we can see that the failure happened at the D character. So okay. we had eaten the A and the B. So the string ABC is willing to eat partial prefixes. Yes, it is. Is there a version of string which only eats if the entire token can uh, be yep. one shot? Absolutely. One shot? Um, some libraries might call that token. Um, uh, the sort of way that we usually do it um, is not kind of. Um, what, what is a scenario where you'd want that behavior? I can't think of it. What is a scenario when you want that behavior? Uh, it's all to do with error messages. Um, so you can see right. we've got AB back this time. And um, what we've done to fix it first is you use attempt. So attempt, it's a very poor name. Um, it, it's sort of, it, it originally called try, but you can't write try in Scala because of try catch. So I called it attempt. Uh, really, it should be something like atomic that much more clearly indicates its sort of behavior but it basically says if the parser that you give it fails it does not consume it right so in this case it, there you go i mean it, it seems, failed it's, that to me it seems like a, the atomic behavior would be what i what i would expect from a parser and uh, the non-atomic would be something that i might spec specify like once in a lifetime right I mean, that's what I do. I, I and have a parse pointer and, be, and roll it backwards if I failed. Just parse again, <laughs> but start over. Yes. Or whatever. Yeah. Now, now the problem the problem with that, um, and it is kind of a thing that there there are some libraries that um, the sort of parse commonly community that accepts that uh, backtracking is something we need to be explicit about is broadly split into two camps. The camp we try which has the atomic behavior, and the camp with cut that has the opposite behavior where you rule out backtracking. So um, cut is very much an idea of when you cross the combinator, it says, do not backtrack through this, right? I've decided that I'm, I'm here now and I'm not leaving. Um, and these two schools of thought are sort of direct opposite to each other. So, so what's the point? Why would you want this and why would you want to avoid it? Well, the first reason you'd want to avoid it is for efficiency's sake. So ideally, you implement all of your parsers as unambiguous, right? So this is kind of already a little bit of a smell because it is ambiguous. 
Um, and if you implement it as unambiguous, then not having backtrack by default helps to fail the parser more quickly, right? It doesn't try and backtrack and do extra things that we know are going to fail. Um, and the other big reason you do it is because the error messages are much more specific if you don't have backtracking. Um, and this is a really, really common thing. So this is something I can evidence quite well. Uh, let's imagine we're trying to pass a language where you've got something like that int x equals 10, that's a valid thing, but you also have int f, int x, blah, 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 our functions, right? Now there's an ambiguity here because both of these things have type identifier at the front of them. So naively what you might want to do if you try and do pass this with pass combinators is you might have um, function attempted or assignment, right? And uh, what you'll find is that this will pass correct values, right? So whatever you give it, if that value would have passed correctly, this works, right? It works fine. The problem is what happens to the error messages? So if you imagine that we we tried doing something like this, right? This is clearly like not okay, right? There, there's just training comma here, the function's not been completed, bad syntax. The error that you're likely to get with this implementation is unexpected open bracket expected equals. And the reason is because while we failed inside the function, we told it to backtrack. So it will walk all the way out, then it will try and go into the assignment and fail that. So what you kind of want is that the, the backtracking can only happen up to when you first encounter an open parentheses. Once, once you know that's there, it's kind of like that's where you put the cut. Like you'd say, if I read an open parentheses, no backtracking. Like we we know now this is clearly a function. It's unambiguously a function. Do not backtrack to assignment. And the thing is, is this comes up so often that you want to do this that, and there are libraries that, that have cut. And what you find is um, you basically find yourself writing cut every other thing, right? You're always cutting. Um, because cuts gives you performance. It gives you a lot of performance. It makes the error messages better. And ideally, you want to minimize attempt. And if you're minimizing attempt, you're increasing the number of cuts. It's like the, on the opposite side. So I picked attempt because it ultimately requires less writing than the other semantics. And ideally, you would aim to, to eliminate attempt entirely, but there's, there are certain circumstances where you want it. This is a good example. So if you're doing tokens, they are usually rendered atomically um, because often they do have ambiguities, right? You know, um, if and the variable i are ambiguously, you know, they overlap. So you do want to have that atomic behavior there. Um, but hopefully that answers that question. Yeah, um, so, uh, so what I'm starting to, think is that tokens are in a way kind of a special case that you want to match them all or nothing but then once you're dealing with um, other structures you kind of don't want to back too far out and if you do you want to be kind of deliberate about when you do that yeah absolutely that, that's that's like precisely um the way the way to think about it and um it's not even the case that all tokens need to be atomic there are some that are are sort of left unatomic stuff like string literals. Once you read a quote, it's kind of unambiguous. That's never going to overlap with anything else. So you don't want to make that atomic because you can get nice error messages about the inside of string literals that way. Um, so, but yeah, in general, yes, tokens should be atomic, and the parser itself built on those tokens is ideally using less or sort of as minimal use of atomic as possible. Um, and that raises a good a good point as well, that when you're using plus combinators, there is no lexa. Tokens or the description of tokens 
are precisely done in terms of the combinators we've already seen. So they just are passes in their own right. They're stitched together. They they sort of get special treatment, um, but ultimately they are just more of the same. Yeah, it's another way to explain it based on the conversation we had, Jamie, is you just keep going. Like normally a recursive descent parser stops at a token. Like that's that's what it's that's what its atomic unit is. And the parser combinator says, ah, screw that. We'll go as far down as you want, all the way to the character. Yeah. So it's recursive yeah. descent down to the characters if you choose to. Yes. Yes. And some some libraries will even support token streams and stuff like that. This one doesn't. Um, no, don't but, tell yes. us about some libraries. <laughs> tell some us about libraries. yours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um it is it is a sort of design decision, but I think the the reason I dislike having token streams um, or having like a dedicated Lexa is because it loses um, it loses an idea of context awareness of of tokens. Yeah, this is certainly better if you have a context aware parser. I I can and in fact the, I think the example that you and I talked about was the thing with the um, less than less than. Is sometimes a shift yes. and sometimes it's for a parameterized type. It's a parameterized type of a parameterized type, right? So how do you yes. know? Because because the, the I think they call it the biggest munch rule. Like when yeah. you hit when you hit you Ma try to take munch, the biggest yeah. tokus token you can find. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. It's, yeah. Maximal munch is um, is is the word for that. And yes, there are plenty. There are plenty of these examples that that do crop up. So. Uh, my favorite one is is minus, right? Minus has potentially three different meanings, uh, depending on when it appears. One is binary subtraction, one is unary negation, and the other is the start of a negative integer literal, right? And ideally, we want to distinguish between all of these different outcomes. And if Alexa is just told you must read minus, you're stuck, right? You have minus. That's the minus token. I um, solved that. I got rid of one of those by saying uh, a minus one was a unary minus on a positive one. Yes. So you can do that. You can do that. Um, and that works up until a point. And that point is it sort of depends on um, whether you have very odd rules about integer literals in your grammar. Um, this is something that trips up our students because we do have one of these odd rules in that we well, say you that should, you should integer... always parse integers as negatives always yes that's, that's where your students mess up yeah because they haven't gotten bitten yet <laughs> they haven't gotten bitten and the thing that we bite them with is that we require that integer literals that appear within the the grammar cannot overflow so they have to be within those two bits and um if you if you do that and you treat you don't make negative integer literals, you can fail to pass very large negative integer literals because it treats it as an overflowing positive integer. So you do have to kind of be aware of these three different sort of classes, but ultimately the parser dictates that because you're going to be at some point in the parser when you ask for them. So it's like in Alexa, Alexa and parser based approach. You have a list of tokens, the Lexa produced that. The parser works with those tokens. In this sort of model, it's more like the parser is doing stuff, and as it is, it is asking for tokens. And it then matches that token at that point as opposed to it already having happened. And it does mean that expressing stuff like this is sort of trivial. Right? You don't need to care about the distinction between these things, uh, with the exception that. Uh, if you're going to read a unary minus, because they do appear in the same kind of position, um, what you usually say is you'll say something like negate is is a minus that is not followed by a digit, right? That that distinguishes it as being independent from a negative integer literal. Um, so this is negative look ahead, um, and uh, this is a property of peg, is that peg gives us positive and negative look ahead of arbitrary depths. Um, similarly to backtracking, we kind of limit ourselves. We don't want to consume an arbitrary thing. So if you if you wrote something like not followed by uh, none, like that would work, but it's kind of a bit wasteful because this could read 
a really, really long number and have to backtrack all the way back out of it again. When really the only thing we cared about is that leading digit. Um, but you can very much get away with, with stuff like this. So you have a negate and you can kind of treat it as a token if you wanted to. Um, I usually do that by giving them the result unit. Um, unit being like, I guess, void. Um, it's, it's the type of one value. So it's not interesting. This, this negate token does not have an interesting value. It's just unit. So um, without a lecture, without yeah. a lecture, uh, what are you doing? Um, for instance, if you put X space minus space Y, um, for your parser. X space, X space minus space Y. Right. Yes. So, um, that's a kind of another thing is that, uh, pass combinators are ultimately what you see is what you get. They behave exactly as you write them. And we haven't told it how to deal with white space, so it won't deal with white space. So ultimately what you do is you start building abstractions. Actually, actually you can stop there and Cliff is happy because he hates white space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can just we can just no, have white space that's and not talk. True. I'm just there are a lot of a lot of comments. Cliff allows white space inside the strings, right? Uh, da, 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 da. I have to come up with some better snarky answers here. I, this I'm is not, definitely pick on Cliff Day. <laughs> I'm not, not good at on the fly snark responses. So, so what do we do in a situation like this? Well, the idea is we want to start building up a notion of what it means to be a token. Um, and let's say the first thing, yeah, this will do. Uh, the first thing we want about tokens is we've already discussed they should be atomic. Um, and not only should they be atomic, but they should also consume white space. Now, we don't know what lexeme is yet, but that is another combinator that we can go and define for ourselves. And this is going to be something very simple, like um, a bit of spaces. Yes, spaces. There we go. I'll do. So uh, spaces is a parser that skips zero or more white spaces. Or I think not white spaces here. I think I would want white spaces. There you go. Um, and we basically have just established a consistent um, uh, consistent scheme for dealing with this. So we're going to say that things should consume white space. Absolutely. And they should always consume trailing white space. Now, why trailing white space? Because if we consume leading white space, then there is suddenly an ambiguity for every single or in the in the entire parser, right? Because we always start by reading white space, then a thing, and we'd have to backtrack through the white space to get anywhere. So the convention is trailing white spaces. And what we then do is we usually build um, something around this to ensure that uh, we sort of complete the convention properly by saying, well, first, any full parser should consume white space, do a thing, and then read end of file. So end of file only succeeds at the end of the input, very elegantly implemented as not followed by item. Right? So this is kind of good example. It's one of these nice examples of why uh, the combinator approach is so powerful because we've got all of these combinators and they can give rise to some really interesting and complex behaviors just on their own. So being able to combine these two things and get EOF is really nice. We didn't need that baked into the language. Um, so this is yeah, how we'd kind of structure it. So we'd say a negate is a token, which means we expect this to be treated atomically. We expect it to consume training white space. And now we don't need to worry about it. So the sort of distinction I like to make is the lexing part of a pass combinator parser are the things that do care about white space. And ideally, you keep them in a different file, in a different object, wherever, from the parser itself. And the parser should never care about white space. So it should always be that it's always handled by the things below. Um, so we probably want this as well. Let me take that. Ideally, in our language, this is probably also a token. 
right? And I actually might also want to give it a label number. Um, so we can start piecing these things together. These would both be sort of tokens in a way. And I kind of treat tokens as being things that return primitive types. So unit, int, string, char, those are sort of tokens. Um, and things that would return AST nodes I consider to be part of the class of the So, uh, yes, hopefully that answers that question about, you know, how, how do we deal with white space? And the answer is you start building things. Um, and this is one of the things I really, really love about Pass Combinators is the fact that we can just build things. Um, it's really neat because, you know, if you think about um, grammars, often we'll find a notion of comma separatedness, right? So you'll have comma separated arguments to functions, comma separated arguments in lists, comma separated all sorts of things. And if you look at a BNF grammar, you'll often see that idea replicated, right? Either they'll factor out some like comma separated expression, or they'll they'll have to rewrite that part of the grammar. <laughs> and you could have comma separated expression, fine, but then if I want comma separated function elements, that's a different thing. It's a different grammar rule. And the beauty of um, past combinators is that we can abstract and build reusable components by like combinators for dealing with these things right um and i'm going to sort of be very cheeky here because it turns out they already have something that's like this um but i can say you know set by one char the documentation will get out of the way so the only problem with zooming in is that the documentation gets obnoxious uh, okay, then we do actually return a list of those things, don't we? There you go. Yeah, so so what I've built here is I've built a way of describing any comma separated thing. In for any any password I like, this could be types, expressions, function arguments, whatever. And I've built it in terms of other pieces. It just so happens I already have a piece for doing stuff like this, but that's you know, beside the point. Um it's sort of like the, the high level idea here is you're using past combinators are like recursive descent, but where the combinators are abstracting sort of boilerplate or um, sort of bookkeeping details away from you so that you can focus on building something that's more like the grammar. And that means we can apply all the same software engineering principles that we normally want to apply, right? We see common code that keeps getting duplicated, well, the answer is make a function that does that and parameterize it by the pieces that are inside, right? The concrete passes that we're interested in. Um, and so we build up effectively. We build up and up and up like this. Um, so, so we still haven't which, seen a which to be yet. fair, which to be fair is the same thing you do in our recursive descent parser. So yes, it's a very, exactly. very similar concept, except this is really capable of incorporating the entire descent down to the characters itself instead of cutting off at a token line and saying, OK, I have a stream of tokens to consume. Yeah, absolutely. That's why I, I sort of think of it is I, I feel like parser combinators are more like recursive descent than they are like parser generators. Right. They they behave very much in that way. It's it's like this whole idea that they they do exactly what you tell them to and nothing more. Right? There's no mystery to pass the combinators in a sense. Once you understand the the core combinators and what they do, you can always figure out what a parser does. Um, it's not like there's grammar transformations and stuff like that that obscure how it acts. It does exactly what it tells you it does. Um, and it makes debugging them actually quite easy as long as you have something like debug combinator. That can say, by the way, this is what's actually going on right now. Um, you know, it, it is easy to debug in that sense. You never get left with this situation where you're thinking, why is it passing this like this? Why isn't it doing that? Um, which is what I sometimes see when when people are wrestling with cluster generators. Sometimes it's opaque and you just don't know what it's doing. Um, but yeah, we, we leverage the the exact same sort of things that you would do if you were handwriting a parser, um, just with you know a lot 
lot sort of further away from the very low level details. Um, so what we were trying to do earlier is we were trying to build an AST. So I am going to make myself an AST. Let's uh, let's make expressions the classic. The simple calculator one. It's the simple calculator, except you're complaining. No, you're not. Okay. Uh, and what else do we need? We need values. There we go. I'll do. Uh, let's make it more. more. So we've got these. This is now an AST. Um, for convenience sake, I'm just going to import all of its cases. Um, so the idea is now that we actually want to put these things together. And uh, we'll learn something along the way about how class accommodators are secretly broken, um, but we'll get there. So we'll start off with um, atoms. Now, atoms are going to be either numbers, and we already know that if we want to change a result. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, if we want to change the result of a parser, we can use map. So in this case, we're saying, we know we've got an integer here and we want to put it in an AST. So we'll just map the AST's constructor over it. Uh, annoyingly, Scala 3 deprecated just writing this. Um, so if I want to avoid warnings, I better write dot apply or something like that. That's probably a nicer way of doing it. Uh, the other thing we'll do is we'll also deal with, now I'm going to be, Cheeky. No, I can't be cheeky, but I can do this. This is where I now have to remember the think. Think. I haven't used Scala three too much, um, so I am slightly missing the syntax for it. But I'll explain what this is in a second. I think it should be S to token S. Hold it. Ah, there we go. So what this is saying is um, this is one of Scala's features called implicits. So this is basically saying that I'm specifying there is a uh, conversion between strings and passes that return unit that uh, the compiler is going to be aware of by a given. And it basically means that if I want to, I can now write string literals, and they mean parsers. So uh, what will happen is I call this, this combinator on a string, and, and Scala will be like, I have no clue what that means. Is there a conversion I can use where this will make sense? And it will find this one and say, ah, right, if I take the string, I turn it into a string parser, void the results so it returns unit, and then make it into a token, I have a parser, and parsers have thens on it. So it's sort of a nice way of getting uh, sort of string literal syntax in our parsers for free. But bear in mind, these are now actually also consuming white space. So these are doing the things we want them to do. Um, now we also need experts. What's the lazy? I'm not a scholar person. What's the lazy? Yeah, so lazy, lazy's lazy. What is lazy? Lazy is basically saying, um, and I can show you what happens if I remove the lazies. Uh, well, is it going to compile? Oh, it's because I'm actually not using them. Let's see. It's just my extra. So we should be able to read 10. And that apparently worked. Oh, I know why it worked. It's because I'm in a Scala script. It's kind of funny. So usually, uh, the reason why this wouldn't work is um, because these are uh, the sort of mutually defined things. Circularly, so no, circularly referential. So you have to yes, do the exactly. lazy, otherwise it has to potentially pre um, dive down infinitely yes yes it does so yeah the lazy in this case it sort of worked out because of the semantics of the scala worksheet but yes that is the idea 
Um, and I think an interesting thing is if I drop this, is Scala going to complain at me? It might. No, it does not complain at me. That's sad. Sometimes it does. I think, again, if I was in a proper, um, a proper Scala environment, it would tell me about this. Um, it would tell me that there is a value that is, oh no, it's because it's on the left. That's fine. I can fix this. We'll pop it over here for a second and hopefully it will tell us. No, it doesn't want to tell us. Um, so what I'm thinking is what it might, sometimes Scala 3 can actually tell us that this is a left recursive value because um, its definition will immediately invoke itself. Um, in this case, it hasn't, I think, just because I'm working in a Scala worksheet. But this does highlight a problem, right? When we ran this, it got stuck, right? And why did it get stuck? Well, it got stuck because if you think about what this was actually doing, so, I mean, I could turn on the debug combinator, but we'll just get a lot of input. Uh, I wanted to comment, and I've now just forgotten how to comment. So, if you think we're passing extra, the first thing we're saying to do is pass atom. And the first thing yeah. we do when we pass atom is pass extra. Yeah. And we're stuck. So, pass combinators do not often support left recursion. This one will work just fine, right? So, we got val 10. There is an ASD node, so we've, we've done something. And I can even put brackets. If I put one bracket, we'll get an error. If I put a bracket there, that will succeed. Uh, usually, we don't want white space to appear um, because white space is very rarely uh, the answer to anyone's problems. Like if, a, if, a, if a syntax error says <laughs> expected open, close bracket, right, that makes sense. Digit, which I guess um, ten was probably, short, could add more digits. Yes, we can always add more digits. And um, again, we might actually want to say end of number because that's a bit more of an intuitive reason for why a digit might be more necessary. But adding white space is never going to fix your problem. It's just going to delay it. So um, usually, what I advise is you hide it, and that's effectively labeling it with the empty string to say we don't care about this. Please don't don't talk about it. Well, what was impressive, though, was when you went into the infinite recursion, it looks like it must be doing a tail call optimization, so it didn't actually run out of stack. Scala. Yes, uh, and it's not Scala's fault, um, not in this case. So the reason why this works is because I've been very careful. Um, and what I've done is, uh, at every point in, in Parsi's development, I've made it impossible for stack and flow to occur. Um, and the first step is that the AST consoles are all using um, trampolines. So they are effectively iterating over a recursion. And um, unlike many combinator libraries, which will, will evaluate this as it is, uh, Parsi compiles itself in some form or another to a very small bytecode hmm. for parsing. And uh, recursion in that sense is done by pushing onto its own stack, but that's a heap based stack. So it, it isn't going to stack the flow, but it may heap, it may run out of heap memory if you left it going for too long. Um, but yes, it, it does not stack overflow. It just sort of, it does what it likes. Um, we never have to worry about that problem, which is good. Um, I was going to remove this and we'll see. There you go. The white space is gone, end of number, all things look nice. Um, but of course, if I wrote an A, which is not legal, we'll get told expected number. Right? So the labels are doing their job here quite nicely. Um, so yeah, we've managed to get some ASTs back. So that's nice. We haven't labeled uh, parentheses of AST nodes, so they're just, you know, not doing anything. That's fine. Don't really care too much about that. And I'm going to pick you up, move you. Over here. Um, so we've learned this issue about left recursion. So if we were going to try and do more, we might expect, well, OK, surely we can just go in and implement these. Um, we haven't really said what their associativity should be. Usually they're left. Um, and so you know, we could try and work our way out, but we'll find that we'll get to a left recursion problem uh, as we go. Um, but this is kind of going to demonstrate what it would look like 
in combining multiple classes to make AST nodes. So it's wrong, but we'll just sort of ignore that fact um, for just a second. So this might be something like this, which is uh, zipped with multiplication for an atom. So this, and there you go, there you go. So this time Scala has actually decided to tell us about it. Infinite loop in function body. So the Scala compiler is already warning us that this is um, this is left recursive. And this is kind of a cheat on my half in that uh, a lot of these combinators you might have noticed have this or uh, this this arrow on their right hand side and that indicates laziness um, but never in their receivers so in this case we really do have term equals term and the scala 3 compiler is like no that doesn't make sense this is this is clearly going to loop forever um, so it's kind of a neat trick that i'm hijacking to detect left recursion um, but if we sort of look past that a second, what is this kind of saying? Well, it's saying read a term, then read a multiplication, drop its result, don't care, read an atom, and then combine their two results by constructing a multiplication node around them. Right. So this will be the first argument to the multiply. This will be the second argument to the multiply. And that's because the underscore and Scala is smart and picks different things at different times. Uh, yeah, the underscore is kind of like this is a hole for a parameter to go. So two yeah, holes here. Yeah, two holes. But where do the two parameters come from? Why not term twice or atom twice? Why term? That so they're coming. Twice? They're coming from this tuple here. So um, you can sort of think that the other way I could have written this would be with lifted notation. That's a tuple in Scala. Yes, gotcha. that's All the right. drama. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the comma. yeah, I didn't catch. Now I do. All right, I'm good. So it's not. It's sort of my least favorite way of writing this. So I'd usually you to write it like this. Um, uh, I don't have that syntax extended, that syntax imported. But I would usually write it like this. But sometimes the type inference doesn't work out so well on this side. It's just like a mole constructor there. I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of. Yeah, it's like he had the other one, which was apply. But I, I'm feeling like I'm reading Ruby at this point. <laughs> yes. Um, and there is a which, way that we which could language is it? Is it Ruby or the thing built on top of Ruby that I'm using? <laughs> uh, let's see if we can I think I've screwed. Have I screwed myself? No, I haven't screwed myself. I think I'm okay. I think what I can do here, if I'm lucky, is I can get an, a nicer syntax for this by magicking it into existence. Pass a bridge to expert, expert, expert. Yeah, and the object is the singleton syntax in yep. Scala. And so the the true the the magic here, hopefully that works. You okay? You are okay. Nice. So um, what is this? Well, uh, this is a singleton object, and in Scala there's these things called companion objects. So this is intrinsically linked with this one. Um, because they live in the same scope of expert. The enum is kind of obscuring it, but that's that's roughly what's going on. And um, as Cameron said, there are apply methods, and apply methods live on singletons. And the sugar is that mole.apply xy is the same as writing mole xy. So if you just sort of treat that syntax as given, what this... Wait. You have a lot of Scala syntax running around here. I'd love to see the same talk given where you were forced to only use C or C++ and not <laughs> use a lot of the Scala syntax to shortcut things. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it's even in Haskell, you the, it's a bit more verbose than it is here. Um, but the sort of key thing that's happening here is that this class uh, is basically doing the OOP template pattern. So it's saying, OK, if you have an apply method that works on expert and expert, then I'll make you a new one that works on parsers of expert. And it's basically doing the zip internally, but it's synthesizing for you. So it now means that we get to call it like this, mull of two arguments, and it's combining them. We can do something similar as well for val. Um, and it's a bridge because it's decoupling the um, 
No, well done. It's decoupling the um, the implementation of these things. So we don't actually know what happens on the inside of these. That means if the if we wanted to start dealing with like position tracking, we can actually do that without changing the parser. So these are a good idea because they keep some of the information about the parser separate from everywhere else. So this is a, really just a software engineering uh, sort of pattern being applied to the parsers here. Um, but there we go. We've seen we've seen how to do this. So we know how to combine multiple results. But we've also observed that left regression is broken. This doesn't work at all. Um, good news is that um, I mean people that are familiar with parsing theory might have heard about um, left corner transforms or stuff like that, which mm -hmm. factor grammars to yeah. remove left regression. Yeah, and. Quite nicely, the idea is that um, these algorithms, these, these sort of factoring algorithms, have a shape that is encodable as a combinator. So what we can do is say something like chain dot left one, and we're saying we're joining atoms together, and what we've got is uh, multiplication. And this is given to us for free by the bridge as well. Um, so this basically says read the operator and return mol. Right. So what this is asking for basically is you have an A or a parser that returns A's, and you have an operator that returns a binary function that combines two A's to make another A. And you're passing one, so an operator, or an, an argument, an operator, an argument, an operator, an argument, an operator. In a left associative way, you are then applying them together. So what this has done is it's captured exactly what we wanted, which is left associative application of multiplication to atoms. We can do something similar here. Um, so we have turns to additions. Make that work. Yeah, so in theory, we can do something like five times 20. Now, we know that obviously um, the multiplication binds tightest here, so parentheses are definitely required. And we've got a mole of add 10, 5, 20. If I took away the brackets, we should get something like an add of 10 and mole 5, 20, right? So this is working as we expect. So the idea here is that we are aware about stuff like grammar factoring, but we don't need to perform them manually. We can sort of encode those recipes as their own functions. And those can do the transformations that we want. Um, and so that's already, that's that's quite nice. Um, and there's some sort of stuff to be said here about type safety as well, because, you know, I could accidentally write this. And that's probably not my intention, right? Multiplication is usually left associative. And the compiler is happy. There's nothing to tell me that this is wrong. And um, this sort of ties quite nicely into this idea that, well, if we wanted to rule that out, we should have probably said something more like this, where the actual type of multiplication very clearly said, you know, this is left associative, where you can imagine terms appearing on the left of the constructor atoms appearing on the right digs deeper. So if you encode it like this, you can generalize this combinators and you can get it so there's type safety, right? Where if you try and read something that's got the wrong precedence or the wrong associativity, it just doesn't compile. Right? These they're sort of they're nicely typed in that sense. But for simplicity, monotyped AST is what we'll stick with. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, we just do have to be a bit careful about you know writing things precisely. Um, but ultimately, we've built an expression parser, right? We've got precedence, um, and we can take it a little bit further by pulling in the rest of Expro, because we kind of have to keep thinking about names, right? And after a while, I'm going to run out of four-letter variable names um, to encode various levels of my, of my precedence table in a sensible way. So. What I will probably do instead is I'll reach for a recipe, right? Because if you stare at this long enough, 
you sort of see it has a very, very obvious pattern to it, right? We have the outermost le level of precedence. We have a chain with the next level in, some operators, and then we have the same thing, next level in, some operators, and then finally we stop some. And again, what we what we do is as programmers, we can think, okay, is there any way we can build something to just deal with this? Yeah, like if you swap 57 and 55, you'd have a recursive descent parser. Yes, and ultimately it will, it will look the same, right? Because it doesn't matter what order they're actually defined in, we're calling extra first. So it is right. it is recursive, it is recursive descent um, because of the laziness. Um, but yeah, could, could we express this in a more concise way? And the answer is, well, absolutely yes. Um, and let's go do that. And the way we do that is by asking for precedence tables, which we can say something like, now I've got to remember my own library. Do I remember my own library? Probably. So I think what I can say is if I pop this here, which way round do we want to go? I think we want to go, yeah, I think specifying the atom at the bottom is probably the best. So we can pop these here. I, don't, I never know how to format this. Um, one day, one day I'll figure out how to format it. I guess they can go like that. So we can say something like, uh, we've got ops, in fits left and we'll pick up my blob there it is and then we'll also say in the next line box in fits left and pick up my other bit there we go that does compile look at that lovely so now we've we basically said, okay, I recognize that there's a pattern here. So let's factor out the pattern. Let's do the software engineering thing. And we can build this thing that says, okay, give me every single layer of precedence in turn. Tell me how to stop, right? What's the, the atoms of this expression? And I will fold these all together and make basically this for you. Um, but this is a bit more sort of concise. It's a bit more clear what it's doing. Um, and it involves less explicit naming. And this is kind of the pinnacle of the expert part. So I think I really should have said fully expert. Yeah. Um, so this is, you know, this is what it is. Um, and I think, you know, ultimately it's, it's, it's quite easy. It's not too much of a stretch to get here. Obviously, you know, we had to know about what the library can give us, but we're building on top of very, very, very basic building blocks. Right, we've we've effectively seen all of the building blocks um, that that come together to build this entire thing. Um, so it's yeah. There's always there's always a trade-off between language and library when it comes to um, DSL, right? And in a yes. sense, in a sense, your library here is a DSL. So if I were only using it once, I would never attempt this, right? If I were writing a PhD paper on it, I would done have done exactly what you're doing. In other words, there's there's a cost both to the writer and the reader of adopting further levels of the DSL. Yes, yes. Because there were a lot uh, of eyes glazing over as you got as you got progressively deeper into into the DSL. <laughs> so I'm just yeah, wondering. Um, how do you implement like the chain operator? I mean, it just seems like magic, I guess. So, so there's a there's many different implementations of it. Um, the sort of most obvious one. Ah, uh, my mind. Can I do it offhand? I think I probably can do it offhand. Uh, what do we? We need A's. So we have an A. We have an O. How would we stitch these things together? Well, the first thing we can do is we can say, well, what we're kind of trying to achieve is something like this, right? And the bracketing is like this. And there'll be another bracket here. And 
another bracket here. Oops. Now, the observation you can make there is, okay, well, if you kind of squint a bit, you could put brackets around these. Now, if you do that, we can kind of say, okay, well, we're kind of reading two different things here. We're reading a P, a beginning one, and then we're actually reading ops and p's next to each other zero or more times and then we just need some way to put them together so what we can do is we can say well we'll read a p um and we'll need to zip it with something later on let's pause on that so we're saying many and then we need uh, let's say op zip p. Now, what zip does is uh, it basically just pairs up two things. So it passes two things, pairs their results. So we now have a list of pairs of operators and values. And all we need to do now is we need to say get my nice size syntax out. So we have an Oh. And what we need to do is combine these these ops together. And you could do this with a loop, right? Um, like if I if I really wanted to, var ack equals x for op y in ops ack equals op ack y y. Uh, Oops. Ah. There we go. That's a simple definition that, that will do the job. So uh, this is kind of the, the cheaty way where you're saying, okay, well, we'll construct a list and then we'll we'll patch the ASTs together on their own later. Right? It works perfectly fine. Um, there's better ways of implementing that don't involve intermediate lists, but this is one way of doing it. Um, so ultimately, it's not so much magic, but you can you can kind of get a sense that this is a version of a left factored grammar. And this is the step that people normally have to perform on the AST to reassociate it afterwards. So it's kind of capturing those two steps as a sort of reusable algorithm in a sense. Um, obviously, there's cleaner ways of implementing this, but for loops suffice. Um, yeah, so everything, everything can just be built like this. Right. And you just have to think, uh, it's kind of an art form of deriving these combinators. It's just, you know, how do I structure this sort of generic pattern in a nice way? Um, but yes, that, that is sort of the gists. And like recursive descent, like, like handwritten recursive descent, you can do all sorts of fun tricks um, with regards to, to sort of error messages and things like that, where um, you can very easily describe bad things, right? Things that go wrong. Is there an example? Is there a good example in this grammar? Not particularly, annoyingly. Uh, yeah, there's no sort of obvious things, but you can imagine that you might have something where a user could make an obvious mistake um, that, that we sort of just know is not true. In fact, there is actually a good example here, I think. There's variable names, right? So user might decide, well, okay, surely X, X is like, you know, um, something sensible. Well, surely I should be able to write variables in my calculator. And what we can do is we can sort of say, okay, well, we know that variables are not supported and we know that users might probably try and write them. And this error message is pretty cryptic in that respect. Could I do any better? And I could say something like, yes, let's assume letters are how this might work. Uh, verified fail. I think I have that from, where does that come from? Oh, it even tells me, that's nice. Of course it's in patterns. So what we can say here is identifiers are not permitted. And uh, this is a pattern that I've taken to calling 
uh, verified failures. And so what this is, is the idea that, okay, well, let's read a letter and we're saying letter is bad, but it, it's like, we don't just want to fail unconditionally by saying identifies are not permitted, because if you wrote a comma, that no longer makes any sense. Right, so one thing I could have done is just, it's just done this. Right? this. This would give the exact same result in this case, fine. But if I put a comma, it's gonna say identifies are not permitted, and that's nonsensical. So the idea of the verified fail here is it says, only make that error message if that is indeed what happened. Right. And so, you know, here, it's like, yeah, there's your regular error message. But here we're like, okay, if we could see a letter, that's the error message that we want to return. Um, and you can get as creative as you want with that. And you can get some really, really strong error messages by applying just these very small generic principles. Um, and verified fail is made in terms of other things. So it, again, it's not primitive. Pretty much everything is made out of other things. Um, but this is sort of real, really nice thing that I like about combinators that is very close to handwritten recursive descent is you can imagine doing exactly that, right? You can imagine exactly reading something in a recursive descent pass that says, try and read a letter. If we succeeded, fail with this bespoke error message. Um, so yeah, I think that's, this is kind of what everything I've shown here is is in some shape or form was what I originally wrote about in uh, one of my papers, the design patterns for parser combinators, um, which was originally written in Haskell, was rewritten in Scala, is rewritten again in my thesis. Um, but it's kind of like these are these high level guiding concepts are used to organize parser combinator things. But ultimately, they are just this small building block for, for making very complex behaviors out of very, very small chunks. So if there's anything anyone wants to see, I'm happy to have to do that. Or any questions about you know, how it how it actually works or we're all stunned. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I have a I have a question actually about um, so so functions like verified fail and stuff. You said it's not primitive. Um, is there a way without going and digging through the source code for it to like spit out what it's made out of so i can sort of find out how different things are built uh no annoyingly um so yeah if you wanted to know how it's built you'd have to go and find it and hope i haven't made an optimized version of it because i sometimes do that um in this case i'm actually curious yeah, as to what this it's not is. so much that i'm need to know how this one is made exactly it's just i was just wondering like if you're working with it if you could sort of say oh how's how's this done and yeah so so the, the sort of usual rules would apply in that what you would do is you would you'd go to its definition right so you just yeah. go there and find out yeah. what it was um the annoying thing is when you run into a a, a sort of hard baked one it's been optimized so it's yeah. completely opaque it looks like an ast node um, because ultimately the way that the Parsi does represent these is by constructing an AST of this, this parsing language. Um, and if you run into one of those, like, yeah, <laughs> you have no extra insight into what it, what it actually is. Um, yeah, but yeah in, in principle, it works like any other library. I mean, really, I think there are some examples in the docs where I do actually show what its implementation is, but, um, yeah, it's a, it's going to be a game of go hunt for it, I guess. Not an inherent problem, obviously, of the of the library. It's That's just pretty normal library. documentation. Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Of course, the deeper you go, the more exciting it gets, because uh, you get into the realms of the abstract machine, which. I think I, I do enjoy because I can get access to it. Um, and sometimes this this year, because because we have a lot of students at Imperial that use this, um, I always say that students are the best fuzzing testers that you could ever imagine. And they will do the strangest things that find the most obscure bugs. And 
when that happens, it very much has to be the case that I say, right, I need to check what what actually has been generated for this. And I will dump the um, the abstract machine instructions um, just at them. And they'll look at them in one They say nothing is foolproof. Fools are very creative. Yes. Yes, exactly. They are. Um, I, I actually, I'm going to run a fuzzing project for past the next year to see if I can find anything more interesting and stamp them out. Yeah. Um, so, but so it's quite fun because the, the passing abstract machine very much, you can see exactly how it operates and sort of see how it exactly what order it processes and how it manages its control flow and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, a modest sized parser might be something like a, a thousand instructions long. Um, so it's not entirely impenetrable, but it's the sort of thing that uh, there's about two, two or three people in the world that get it, and I'm one of them. Um, but yeah, no one ever needs to, so it's fine. I think someone was someone started saying something. Uh, well, I I actually had another thing. So when the topic of parsers comes up, I always think of this uh, this project that. Alan Kay talked about a few years ago and sort of announced and then some of the some of the people that worked with him went off and did this thing called ohmjs and if you ever looked at this and I, it's not, not a project I've ever worked with but because just because it's in JavaScript and I never had a need to parse things in JavaScript but I've always found it very curious because it it uh, gives you these like very detailed um breakdowns of how your parse has unfolded in a sort of debugging mode and i don't i haven't figured out if it's useful but i'm not sure i'm just wondering if it's something that you've ever seen or it's on your radar or it's anything you care about um it's not but it is definitely something i care about um other than the debug combinator which we've seen it is for basic it gets the job done um most of the time it works out i do have a project student at the moment because I had um, debugger envy from looking at uh, Antler's debugger. Uh -huh. um, and so I actually have a student currently working on a sort of visual debugger for, for parser combinators, where it does render at each step the sort of unfolding of the, the parse tree and uh, progress yeah. that it makes throughout the grammar and, and what it did so at various points. You might want to check OM out because I think it's pretty cool. I mean, I put put a link in. They have this little online editor, so you can like type in expressions and see how they parse and stuff. That that actually, <laughs> funnily enough, this looks almost identical to what my student currently has got rendering in um, with the Java effects. So uh, yeah, I will throw this over to him, okay. and uh, he'll probably get some use out of it or some inspiration. Um, or at least some related work. Mm. Okay. So yeah, thanks for that. So I'm wondering, you know, if you're going to represent everything as these weird abstract operations and compile them, then why not use like a real parser algorithm like DLR or Early? You know, why why is you know parse backup parsing or whatever so so good? I mean, it's so. So yeah, it's a it's a fair point. Um, so obviously the the nice thing is that uh, the combinators are very closely linked with that style. So um, the the represent the sort of translation between the two is very very clear. It's very obvious, and it like I said, it does exactly what it what it advertises it does. Um, you could, in theory, compile them to other because I'm doing this as a compiled thing, I could compile them to parsing tables or other types of algorithms or whatever. Yes. Um, but it's sort of like, this is the very natural abstraction for it. And um, the sort of semantics that it has give rise to these very neat error messages. I think the error messages are a big, a sort of big draw of this kind of modified peg. Um, that works quite nicely. Um, but I also think that the performance can be, you know, pretty, pretty good. So the this is, you know, work that basically spawned out of my master's thesis and got wildly out of control because we started using it. 
Um, my actual PhD thesis is doing something a bit more extreme than this, where I actually use metaprogramming to generate handwritten recursive descent from the parser that's been described. So in that sense, it really is recursive descent, and it comes with all of the same properties. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of recursive descent as a passing strategy. So that's why I go with this, but yeah, absolutely. There's benefit as well. There are combinator libraries, I think that target stuff like GLL um, and other things like that. They, they certainly exist and uh, it's different algorithms for different people, basically. Okay. Yeah, I, I pasted an ear, early library for Haskell in there. That's, I don't know. In the doc, it's, yes. I don't know. I mm haven't -hmm. seen it, but oh, I mean, cause like I, I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I I see all these people that say, "Oh, Packard is wonderful." You know, I I I never have to worry about getting a parse I don't like, and then I'm like, "Well, but yeah, you just threw away all the ambiguous parses because it's." <laughs> I don't know. So yeah, I mean, it, it's true that um, uh, for those that are aware, Packrat is the sort of uh, main passing algorithm for Peg itself. Um, so it's sort of very heavily related to these. Um, and yes, it's sort of you you you're aiming to remove these ambiguities, but um, most of the time, what you're achieving there is is ambiguities always introduce bad time complexity. Uh, unless you have stuff like memoization in the passing algorithm and stuff like that. So you're kind of eliminating that. Um, a sort of parser combinator implementation that is doesn't have any sort of attempts that are not uh, uh, bounded by a constant number of characters. So stuff like a keyword, like backtracking over a keyword is a constant number of characters, is OM. Right? So you can guarantee it's linear time. And you can guarantee that if you shove attempt everywhere, you could touch exponential time. But the secret is don't do that. Um, so, you know, you get some nice guarantees that this is going to be linear. Um, it does have nice error messages. It works out quite nicely and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, it's ultimately, hard to, it's actual... hard to imagine. It's hard to imagine having goals beyond that. Like, yeah. Yeah. If, the, if the performance is 01 and the error messages are good and you get the AST out of it that you want to, what else could you ask for besides, you know, you want your I'm not going to say that publicly because we're getting recorded, but yeah. You can ask to, to have, you know, parse ambiguous grammars as well, right? Yes. You know, so, so like this ambiguous really grammars. Thing. It, um, so it, it parses. Who, in who would want to do ambiguous grammars though? And then it parses, it also parses ambiguous grammars. And then it has error messages. So, you know. Mostly I don't want to read code that's ambiguously parsed. <laughs> like you, you yeah, can so, have the grammar, but I don't want to read your code because I don't know what the hell it means. So ambiguous parses are, are one thing. Sometimes they're useful, not so much for programming languages. We do kind of want them to be unambiguous, but there are definitely domains where ambiguous parses are acceptable including stuff like natural language processing. Um, but Alan, are you thinking of natural language? What, wh where is your thinking? Well, no, no, from? so like, it's much easier to design like a pass after you get the ambiguous parses that filters out the ones you don't want, like a precedence parse, right? I mean, sure, you can like factor your ter your terms into hundreds of classes of different, you know, precedence terms, but you can just say, I'll parse it in as an ambiguous mishmash of operators, and then whenever there's an operator that is higher precedence and lower precedence, I'll just exclude that from the list of possible parses. Right? And you can do that. Right. It's, I'm not saying it's faster or anything, but like- I mean, you can. Of... You can absolutely do that as well. So, you know, I could have written this parser as, you know, read me uh, the atoms separated by whatever operators don't care. And I could very easily write the sort of, um, the map that then puts the tree in the right shape. Of course I can. Um, so it's not like you're limited to, to not doing those things. It's like you, you really can do anything. 
Um, I, partially is I, I threw into the doc the AA code for my operator presence table, which is just a literally a list of the operator classes and grouped by their precedence. So yep. there, there's a trivial way to go define the precedences however you want them. Somewhere in the start of the universe, I read that table and I associate it with the tokens and I never look back. Like the parser just grabs the token, looks it up in the table, says, oh, your precedence is X before Y and I'm done here. So I don't know. But like, what if yes. you something weird, like a cycle of precedence, you know, like plus is greater than minus and minus right. is greater than times and then times, you know, right. loses. Plus. Because I have a table, you can't write a cycle of precedences. It ain't a precedence if you got a cycle. That's, they're all the same level if it's, if it's in a cycle. No, That's no. Very true. I mean, you, you parse A plus B and then parentheses B times C and then- No, no, you, you end up with two acceptable parses or more as soon as you get a cycle and then they're all level, they're all the same level. Well, but, but you can okay. disambiguate specific parses. You just can't disambiguate them when you have multiple operators in the same- That's process. what I'm saying. If you, if you make a cycle, you can't tell who's first. If there's a cycle of presences, there's no way to say who's first. So therefore- you have to pick some other arbitrary metric on top of it that's not there's a precedence to says I picked one or else you had two valid parses and the program has two different meanings. So I see Alan's got furiously got an example going. I, guess I, like, I, think, I think that's Aaron actually. I'm, I'm not seeing any. Well, that's, yeah, I'm typing the plus B plus on C things. Right, but you have parens, so you have removed the precedences with the grouping. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, that's a, I'm saying that's how I want it to parse if I didn't have any parens. So you, you want rock, paper, scissors, precedence. That's, that's which what that's you're trying to say, yes. It's now a tuck. Yeah. Just, so just if I write, generate the table at random every time you start the compiler. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so let's see. I mean, so then like, you know, A times C, well, let's see, A plus B minus, whoops, uh, I can't type anymore. <laughs> minus B and then right. And so it's, you know, so, so like, it's not like it's right or left biased. It's just that these are the precedents. You know, now if you have something like A plus B, times C minus D, you know, that's where you get into trouble and you'll need to like, you know, oh, you'll put, be put like, your groups where you expect it to, to parse. So, so what I instead I heard you say is in any two pair of operators adjacent to each other, you can arbitrarily pick a precedence based on the right. pair of operators. Right. Yeah. So like, I, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to let you work out that language and grammar. Thank you. Right. Well, no, no. That, like I'm saying, that's really all there is, is that it works for if you have two operators next to each other because yeah. you've defined, you know, this mishmash of rules. Yes. And then three, it's ambiguous. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm busy saying that this does not look like anything I'm interested in solving. And I'm, I'm happy to have you work out your PhD thesis. Yeah, I think the use case that's interesting it. for an ambiguous parse grammar is for the errors where I say, hey, you gave me something that is ambiguous. Here are two things that are unambiguous versions of the ambiguous thing you gave me. Which one would you like, developer? Please copy and paste one of these into your code. Isn't that what AI is for? Oh, don't even. Wouldn't you oh just put God. abort, retry, fail? Yeah, you could I mean, definitely just, do that. Well, that's, that's what he just said. He said, hand it back to the developer. Put your right, but I, but you can make there. a better error message if you know what the two ambiguous parses are. Oh, I have one for Alan. And you say yeah, one way one. that you could make this unambiguous is to put the parentheses here. And one way that you can make it unambigu unambiguous is to put the parentheses over there. Yeah. But pick one. Pick one. Right. So so a, a, a common mistake is and 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 or or the short circuit in large expressions. People screw up their operator precedence in C and in Java. And just say, I disallow you to have an ungrouped and, 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 or, or, because you're most likely to get it wrong anyhow. Always, you must have parens when you use mixed and, ands, and, or, ors. 
I mean, that's probably a better answer than I'm just going to start doing it left to right because they have equal binding affinity. Right, right. Almost surely if it was left to right, you got it wrong. One of one of the persons moving from one environment to the other got it wrong. Somebody moving from C to wherever to wherever it is back to Java, they, they're writing it wrong. Hold on, hold on. Which language has them on the same precedence? I swear I've seen this. I don't I mean, know what language. I don't doubt it, but with... I, I, I've which? seen it. So what, no, what's no, the question like, again? Pearl. I fucking, I don't know. What is, what is the language that has and, 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 or, or at the same precedence level? I believe that so like MATLAB question. had some interesting bugs because it considered and to be a kind of multiply and or to be a kind of plus. Yes. So if you mixed pluses and ors, you got very unpredictable oh, uh, things. <laughs> really? But, the, but he wouldn't do precedence on the ands and ors, right? Because this math has an obvious precedence there. Right, like the ands were stronger binding because and is multiply yeah, and right. or is plus. Right. So right. all the ands happen before all the ors. I mean, I sit down and do Boolean expression simplification games using these kind of things. And, um, but there were times when I used an and that had a mathematical operation on either side and was very surprised when the and happened before the additions on either side of the and happened. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. I get it now. Yes, this is an operator error. Not, I was like, and not, should not, not an have stronger binding affinity than yeah, yeah, plus or times. That's, that's, that's true. By the way, chat, chat GPT believes that there are no languages that have and and or at the same precedence level. Yeah, huh, that's good to know. Chat GPT, if there are oh, any no, I just asked it. And, and multiply. Plus plus. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you ask chat GPT four or three? <laughs> I don't, well, this is, did you do double ampersand or single ampersand? Double ampersand. I'm using oh. the beta for five. Okay. No. I'm, well, weird, because like mine says they have- At some point, it starts asking me questions. C, and so like A or B and then C will parse with uh, right bias. And so- um, I, yeah. Okay, I just looked. It does not seem to be MATLAB that had this problem. Now I don't know which language was messing me up by having have, AND have stronger binding affinity than math. Right. I have totally seen this in a language before. They had no no precedence. It was just left to right on those. Just, you know, first come, first serve. Hmm. Never mind. But so I, can't I have a, a that. question for Jamie, actually. Um, yeah. I noticed, uh, well, one of your early examples, you basically ran code on the on the uh on the individual combinator like in the course of parsing and so you could do sort of arbitrary operations in that case you uh like sort of stringified some tokens and parsed them using java um but Excellent. yeah that one so but do you find that that's a useful feature that you use like frequently um so usually the mapping is going to be to construct stuff. Um, so the, the disadvantage, I mean, we saw the disadvantage of this, right? The disadvantage was that uh, a Java failure does not translate to a parser failure. Right. Uh, but and there you, are ways, you, there are so ways to... Can you go a bit uh, more sophisticated with this function and actually return a parser error in case things are on going around? Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and then the, like the so I, like to me it looks like you could actually use this to build a whole uh, interpreter. Uh, let's just see what happens, shall we? Let's put in so we need a really big number. Not do. So uh, yeah, the question is, can I make it work? The answer is probably. Well, I mean, yeah, I don't. It's okay if uh, just so. Yeah, this is going to be something like um, using partial functions notation. This is like going to be uh, to int option. Oh, no, I need to make it a string first. Is that a thing? That is a thing. There you go. OK, so now we're saying if that worked. Yeah. In this case, there we go. Horrible implementation of that because it's doubling up, but right. for convenience. So this, in principle, 
Oops, the defined Q mark of the times. That, but no, yes. I'd what be this sure. she is there you go. We don't know what the pass error was in this case, but we definitely got one. So I'd, be, um, I'd be more interested if you just in this function didn't even do anything, just return an error that looks like a parser error to say, here's some interesting information about your parse that I've calculated, I've computed through this function, but the interesting thing is an error. Yes. I mean, you could, uh, you could do that as well um, by saying something along the lines of, but that's a specific function for generating an error. And I'm wondering yes. if, you, if you could, uh, like, in yeah. A, so you, you can't you can't interleave. Yeah. So I think what you're asking for effectively is um, is interleaving um, exceptions. So like being able to, to incorporate exceptions into the passing flow. Um, sort of. Not uh, what I'm. What I'm more saying is. Uh, you know, you uh, do this um, digit dot map map thing, and in the body of, of that function, you're gonna say, "Look, you know, you know, it's a it it's obviously there are better ways to do it with digits, but imagine it's a more complex structure you're looking at. So you mm -hmm. look at how many digits there are. Oh, too many digits. Um, I can't parse this. So you could." Put out an error message that says, you know, like this is not a valid int. Uh, but if it is valid int, it would actually just produce it. Um, yeah, which is which I think is exactly captured by what Collect was saying. I think it's like uh, that idea of you're saying this might succeed as long as this condition is correct. And if it's not, here's how you go and make the error message about that. Oh, I see. Okay. So it's like what collect is, it's basically combining a map and a filter. So the filter is kind of what you're asking for there is, I want to verify my data. Um, but at the same time, I want to convert it to something, which is the mapping part. So that's what that's what collect accomplishes. So you can do that, but it's sort of like, there is a limited way in which that works. Yeah. Okay. As for how often do you use this? Well, it appears quite often, depending on how tightly interleaved your semantic domain is with a syntactic one. So when I mentioned earlier that we have these numbers that can't overflow in uh, in the toy language that we use at Imperial, that is captured exactly by a collect that, that you know tries to turn it into a number and says there's not this is this overflows, here's the rounded range of numbers, this is not fitting in it. There you go. Um, Equally, you could do interesting things like uh, you can disambiguate between uh, ambiguous things. So if you imagine you have like pair literals, Haskell pair literals that can have an arbitrary number of things, and you have bracketed expressions, right? How do you write a parser that doesn't require backtracking on an expression? Because bracketed expressions require an expression. A tuple requires many expressions separated by commas. And if you want to eliminate that backtracking, you precisely use a map, uh, and I call it an arbitrator, which would basically pattern match on the number of expressions you've got. And if you have one, it constructs a friend's nose. And if you have more than one, it constructs a pair node. So sometimes you do read into these, you sort of touch them slightly. Um, and really, you just do it when it's convenient, right? When, it, when it's very, e very, very much easier to do the verification language side, but you know how to make nice error messages out of that, and you want to reincorporate it back into the parser, you just do that. Um, so it's, you know, it's not really, really common, but it definitely crops up and it's definitely a useful thing to do. We're getting low on time. Do people have any more questions here? So when you think about error messages, because you're using all these combinators to build up to the place in the syntax where you're at, do your mm -hmm. error messages end up looking like a stack trace of, oh, this didn't work because I was expecting a float and I was expecting a float because this higher level thing was expecting it and this higher level thing was expected by an even higher level thing? Like, how do you make Not the errors look reasonable? 
So you that this is this is one of the reasons why backtracking is sort of limited in this way because it, it keeps it at the most distant thing. So usually you'll just get the the most relevant part of the error. Um, there is a feature that I want to build into this for contextualization. So you you mentioned that because of this thing, because of this thing. So something I do want to have is something like in file blah, in class blah, in function blah, as you verse through the grammar. Um, because these are very natural places for the user to go and look, right? But usually it's just focused on the immediate thing that's there. So you don't really have a trace as such. The information of how you got to this point is not encoded in the error message. It's, it's very much localized. Um, but it, it is quite effective. So um, uh, yeah, it, it does. It does end up that this is a reasonably good heuristic for making nice errors, is to just focus on this deepest part and what's happening over there. So, do you have that kind of breadcrumb thing you were talking about uh, going, or it's just something you are thinking of adding? It's something I know how to add. I just haven't had the time to add it. So, I oh. plan to do it for the next major release. Um, so that we can have these nice things for next year. Um, yeah, it's it's really straightforward to do, as far as I can tell, famous last words, but it's just, yeah, finding the time, even if it would just take me less than a day, just finding that time to just go and do it is like, I have better things to be working on. <laughs> yeah. For now. Yeah, I just feel like it would be nice if parsers had good ways to explain to me what happened, because you run across lines of code like this, and you're like, wait, it's super confusing. Uh, I just dropped in chat a bit of Python 2. Yes, looks like Python 2 with octal literals. And it like it makes sense once you think about how the literals work, but. What's yes. the chair? I'm guessing for imaginaries, right? It looks like, although I would have said, I, mean, I don't know. Octal twenty think, became a twenty on the J, not a. Why? Why is so? This is um, because parsing complexes doesn't do octal. As soon as you <laughs> add a J, it goes. This is a complex. This is yeah. not a thing that can be yeah. octal. This sounds like a so Java is, puzzler. It's a Python puzzler. It's a Python so two is, puzzler. Yes. So this is exactly the sort of thing that you use this verified fail pattern for. Is that you know if you could predict that someone might try and write octal literals, you could definitely make the error that that fits this. Um, I think there are some of those. Parsley has some built-in functionality for building lexers, um, and it handles stuff like octal and hexadecimal notation and stuff. And it does make some errors that are that work nicely for this. Um, but it is sort of like it's down to the parser writer to to identify these things, right? Um, so if you if you as the parser writer figure right, out and they changed it that was one of the changes they made for Python three was that if you try to do this thing it's like um, no I don't know what you're trying to do but neither do you so 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 move from accepting it as a bizarre parse to an error message yes yes yeah, so this is the Python three upgrade okay fine yes. a lot of screaming and yelling on Python three made a Python for this though. All right, what else? Levo, did you have a question at one point? Oh, you're muted. He said no. It's sleep with the wheel. All right. Well, if there's no other questions, I'm going to call it here. Yeah, that, that's my approach with parsers. No matter how good your error messages are, I would like better error messages, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, there is no such thing as good enough error messages from a compiler. Yeah, but it's not usually the parser that has the problem with the error yeah. messages. It's usually much, much later. In the, yeah, the problems the between the keyboard and the chair. <laughs> oh, yes. Recently, the REST compiler has been trying to teach me about borrows. Well, for example, yeah, the parser is not going to tell you that. <laughs> no matter how uh, good it is. But in general, I think um, if I had to sum up past these messages, as I say, they're good by default. It's um, it's something that we observed 
uh, that our mark scheme for error messages, because we do assess the quality as, as part of um, the part of marking for the compilers course, uh, it, it got broken by the presence of Parsley. Uh, the mark scheme just sort of fell over because suddenly people were doing nothing and were able to get um, five or six marks out of seven. Um, and, and so we had to get creative with, you know, demanding that they do use stuff like verified fail and stuff to, to make an effort. Um, and in the mark scheme used to work, Antler was the dominating implementation because you leave Antler to its own devices and its error messages are truly trash. Um, so yeah, I sort of, my, my aim here is really, can I make them as good as possible by default? And then the parser writer can tune them themselves and I should give them the tools to do that. Sounds good to me. Thank you. It's been a very interesting talk and a uh, very eye-opening, interesting way to do a DSL for building a parser. Yep. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been fun. Yes, you're welcome. And uh, maybe we'll see you on Discord in the future, too. It's all good. Sure thing. All right. I'm going to kill the video, and people can bail when they want. So bye-bye, YouTube.